Let me ask you a question. How would you define the word faithfulness? How would you define the word faithfulness? Or what pops into your mind when you think, you don't have to answer out loud, just kind of think, and maybe I, 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 let me go a little deeper and say, who pops into your mind when you hear the word faithfulness? Is there a person? It could be Bible time. It could be maybe somebody you know. It could be somebody in this room. Maybe somebody that's mentored you or somebody you look up to spiritually. Who comes to your mind when you hear the word faithfulness? Amen. Our faithful shepherd. I'll tell you what. I read an article this week uh, about a pastor who was invited to a church to speak. And then after the service, they did what all good Christians do. They ate. They had a potluck, right? I mean, that's like the best way to eat. A potluck, amen. And they all gathered around, and he was seated at this table. They kind of told him that he needed to sit over here with this group of older ladies, and they were all just chatting so happily about their casseroles, and it was an awesome time, and he was just enjoying it. But then he, he heard a rumor that there was going to be a big surprise happening, a surprise presentation for one of the ladies who was sitting next to him, but she didn't know. It was going to be a surprise. And her name was Miss Peggy. And sweet Miss Peggy was this incredible, vivacious young lady who was about to be honored as one of the faithful children's kidmen Sunday school class teachers. You see, she had served so long that she was now having to move into an assisted living place, and she was finally going to have to retire not be able to do that. But what made this so remarkable is that she taught this small group class of young children, not just for five years, or 10 years, or 30 years, or 50 years, or 60 years, Miss Peggy faithfully taught these precious children 70 years. Wow. So it's not, not been alive 70 years, <laughs> taught for 70 years. What faithfulness. This is remarkable. 70 years. Now think about this, guys. This means that she taught young children who just a couple years earlier might have lost their father in World War II. She lived and had to counsel kids through horrible times in our country, like the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and JFK. She had to deal with that. She would come and eagerly gather together, I imagine, back in the space race days and eagerly talk about, ooh, the Apollo moon landings and all this stuff. She walked through all these. She walked through 9-11 and Vietnam and all these things. She talked through all these things that we just kind of like reserve as dusty history. She lived it and she shepherded these precious young lives to all the tumultuous ups and downs. And I want to tell you guys, God sees this and God sees your faithfulness. He sees, and he will reward openly. He sees your faithfulness. He sees and knows every faithful servant of his. And today, I want us to examine the life of another faithful servant, someone who also faithfully led his people for almost 70 years, Joshua. 67 years, to be exact. You remember, a couple weeks ago, we started looking at Joshua, and we talked about him being one of the goats or having to follow one of the goats, one of the greatest of all time, and we talked about a modern-day goat, Nick Saban, St. Nick, Alabama, God bless America, roll tide. And we talked about who in their right mind would want to follow a coach like that? And in like manner, who in their right mind would want to follow Moses, a man who had done so many powerful things, a man who got to commune with God nearly face-to-face -face in the burning bush and all these incredible things? And Joshua was that man. And God raised him up. And we're going to see that he had some big shoes to fill. But oh, my goodness, what happens today is so amazing. Go ahead, open your Bible, Joshua chapter 24, or pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me welcome our online guest. Great to have you with us. If you're checking us out for the first time, a special welcome to you. And if you're here in the room for the first time, I know we got Miss Sue here on the back row. We won't embarrass her or call her out by any means. Uh, it's so good to have you. And if there's any other guest here, a special welcome to you. My name is Matt Mitchell. Uh, I'm one of the teaching pastors and the lead pastor here, and it is a pleasure to have you with us today. All right, did I give you time to find it? Joshua 24, here's what we're going to do. I want to set the context, because context is key. When you look at these scriptures, Joshua here is now known as a victorious warrior, but he is an elder, and I mean elder statesman, 110 years old to be exact. 
That's getting up there. 110. And he has led the people faithfully now for 67 years, took over for Moses, and he, along with Caleb, are the only two survivors left from the generation that came out of Egypt. They're the ones that crossed the Red Sea. Right? They saw this. Everyone else gets to hear about it. They were the ones who wandered in the wilderness. They were part of the 40 years because of disobedience. So he and Caleb alone are left out of this generation. They're entering the promised land, and now Joshua has come to the end of his life. And he's gathering the people around him, and he's going to give them one last bit of instruction. But he's not going to speak from himself. He is going to speak for God. And it is going to be so amazing. In fact, when we read these verses, I want you to count how many times he uses the word I. Because he's not saying I, Joshua. He's speaking for God in these moments. He's saying, I, God, have done this for you. And he is going to say 16 times, I did this for you. I did this. But we just sang about it. It was amazing. You led me through Egypt. You, you brought me out. All these things. And this is what we're about to see in the scriptures, this incredible summary of all that God has done. But something is not right. Something's a little off. See if you can detect it. Start reading with me. It says this, but I, God, took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. And to Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt. And afterward, I brought you out as free people. When the Egyptians chased you with chariots and charioteers, I brought you, I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. And then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, it was I who brought you into the land of the Amorites. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan River and you came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jalatazites. But I gave you victory over them all. I even sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It wasn't your swords. It wasn't your bows. None of that brought you victory. I, I, the Lord, gave you the land, land that you hadn't worked on. I gave you towns, towns you didn't even build. The towns that you're living in now, I gave you the vineyards and the olive groves for food, though you didn't even plant them. Right? So Joshua's going through this, and he is outlining good thing after good thing that God has done for them, bringing them out of slavery, bringing them into the promised land. And this just gets me thinking. Let's just ask a great question. If you were to take a moment and write down your list of good things that the Lord has done, how long of a list would it be? Because Joshua's got a long list. When we think about God has blessed us, every blessing, every relationship, every meal he's provided, every bed that we lay our head on, everything, how long would your list be today? Joshua's got this incredible long list, and God is reminding the people all he's done, and it's for a reason. Check out what happens next. See if we can start putting this together, reading in verse 14. So here's what I want you to do. Fear the Lord and serve him half-heartedly. Oh, contraire. Serve the Lord wholeheartedly. There's a reason he's saying this. Put away forever your idols that your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River in, in uh, Egypt. and Serve the Lord alone. He's, he's, ad, he's admonishing them now. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors that served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live now? I love this. Here's those famous words. But I'll tell you what, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Check out their reply. This is, I'm setting you up. They replied, oh, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. <laughs> we would never, never do that. We, not like we have a track record of that. <sighs> Joshua, what do you, we would never 
abandon the Lord your God. For the Lord our God, he's the one that, uh, uh, what did he just say? He's the one that rescued us from our ancestors, from slavery in the land of Egypt. Yeah, right, you know, you, you were there, right? He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. And as we travel through the wilderness among the enemies, it was him that preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites. We know that. And all the nations living there. So yes, we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Yada, yada, yada. Can you imagine what Joshua's thinking here? Imagine these Israelites. They're listening to Joshua. And I wonder if any of them are starting to connect the dots. Wait a minute. This is sounding an awful lot like Moses when Moses was about to die, and he was given his final instructions. And like, we look around, Moses, we saw Joshua. We kind of knew who was next in charge here. But we look behind Joshua, and we don't really see anybody. And this did not bode well. Like, Moses started talking like this, and he was about to die. And now Joshua's talking, is he about to die? Because we were nervous when Moses, but now we are quaking in the sand that this guy sounds like he's giving final instructions before dying. Think about this. And he's lining them up, and he's guiding them, and he's trying to intercede, he's trying to communicate with God on their behalf, and Joshua's done all this, and then he gets right to the heart of it. He goes, guys, if you want to be a nation... You better fear the Lord your God. Worship him. Serve him only in sincerity and faithfulness. And for the love of donuts, get rid of your idols. They keep coming back. Get rid of these idols, these false gods that your fathers. In other words, Joshua is saying, you need to serve the God who has saved you. Because if you don't, it's going to be different this time. So in verse 14, look at it again. He says, here's what you're supposed to do. I want you to fear the Lord. I want you to serve him wholeheartedly. You need to put forever away your idols, those that everyone worship, and I want you to serve the Lord alone. Okay, notice how he starts with fear the Lord. We just finished summer in Proverbs and Psalms. Fear the Lord, beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. We know this is, this is an ongoing tenant of our faith. This is something I think that we have lost in the world today. A proper reverence and awe for whose presence we come. I think we've lost a little bit of this. and you know, I think even in, among God's own people, we are so easily distracted these days. And when we do come and fear the Lord, we come and we gather. We, sometimes I think we rush in and we, we're, we're frazzled. We come in like Kramer and our hair's all up. I'm like, what just happened? And we sit down. I missed the first three songs. I don't know. I just, I just don't feel like I connect with God here. You know, it's like, really? I got to brag on somebody. <clears throat> A little birdie told me that one of our college people at college got up early and drove over an hour and a half to be here to gather faithfully. A little Miss Hannah Barton on the front row right here <laughs> thought you'd sneak in. We'd, we'd call people out here. What a testimony of faithfulness. Do you know how easy it is to just chill in college and just, it's easy for us here, <laughs> but to get up and drive. I think sometimes we lose the holy awe when he says, fear the Lord. And we rush in, not even remembering whose presence we are about to enter in. I read an article about an Anglican priest, an uh, Anglican pastor in Northern Ireland. His name's Alan McCann. And he shared this message about this very passage. And he boldly stated this to his congregation. I think this went out over the interwebs. He's in Ireland and he says, church... We, I can't, I'm not even going to try the accent. I just can't do it. You want me to, don't you? You want me to try it? Okay. <clears throat> Church, we I can't do it. We come with hearts unprepared and minds straying all over the place. And I want to go further. I want to give you a perfect example of your lack of fear of the Lord here at Holy Trinity Church. Some of you are sitting here and chit-chatting the entire way through Holy Communion. If you're new to the faith, that's the Lord's Supper. It's when we take the elements that we remember. It's a very holy, very sacred time. I want to remind you, in 1953, when they televised the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, they did not televise her receiving Holy Communion. The cameras cut away because they considered it so sacred that even the secular news media didn't want people talking over it in their homes. And then he said... Even the secular media, even those pagans, think it more sacred than some of you do on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Respect and fear of the Lord. Fear and reverence of the Lord is where it starts. This is why he says, nation, I want you to fear the Lord. 
then you turn away from your idols. Be sold out to him. So Joshua's first admonition to us is this. Serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Serve the Lord with all you've got. Don't hold anything back. One translation says, serve with all faithfulness. And I love that. Don't miss that little word, all. There is gold there. Serve the Lord with all faithfulness. There's a lot of people who are serving the Lord today casually. There's a lot of people who just serve in some faithfulness. And maybe you're here today and more than the Lord is, is, is talking to you. And go ahead and let your guard down and, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Am I serving you, Lord, with all I have? Am I serving you with wholeheartedness and all faithfulness? Or am I doing it half-hearted? Or one-quarter-hearted? Or one-thousandth one of a percent-hearted? Allow the Lord to speak. Don't wait for the end for the challenge. Are you wholeheartedly praying for your lost neighbors to come to know Christ? Are you wholeheartedly speaking up and sharing what God has done in your life and that he is good? Or are we keeping our head down and not rocking the boat? Because it's easier. It's easier to do that. Just keep your head down. Be chill, Pastor. What are you getting all so excited about? Are we serving the Lord with all faithfulness when we join in the slander and the gossip of our neighbors? Or heaven help us, even brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Are we serving the Lord in all faithfulness when we are just kind of going along with the shady business practice or the lies that we have to turn a blind eye to and just kind of, I didn't see that, and we're silent? Are we serving the Lord wholeheartedly in all faithfulness when we fail to speak up for Christ? I think we can go on and on, but I don't even have to because you know why? Because we've all been there. <laughs> all right, so let's bring this into the, the practical world. Take a moment where you are. And ask the Lord to show you, God, is there any area of my life that I'm not serving you in all faithfulness? In my home, in my job, at school, in my relationships. Is there any area of my life? Holy Spirit, would you reveal that to me? See, Joshua's saying, guys, it's time to be faithful. It's time to throw away the idols. It's time to throw away the false gods doesn't matter if your father worshipped him or you served him over in Egypt. Apparently, these idols and gods kept coming back because idol worship is a big deal. I want to show you something. Take a look at this picture here. You ever notice how a stream winds around and does this? Do you know there is a very graphic geological reason why this happens? It's because water will always take the path of least resistance. And it will carve whatever's the simplest, even if it's crazy not straight and crazy winding and, and going all over. Think about this path of least resistance. This is what happens. People, in, in, in the lives of people, we become crooked because we will naturally tend to follow the path of least resistance. And if it involves bowing down to a few cultural idols, so be it. So the culture doesn't get Christ. That's why it's our job to bring Christ to the culture. Right? The culture doesn't need an echo of itself. It needs an antidote. And we hold those keys. Y'all remember that great quote? It, we, we probably talked about it a dozen times over the last 20 years. And it said from Edmund Burke, all that's required for evil to triumph is for good men to just do nothing. Just do nothing. Just, just chill, pastor. Go along. Don't, why are you rocking the boat so much? God, you're a spaz. What is your deal? And we know that quote, and we share it from time to time, but you know what we don't know? But you never hear? We never hear the rest of that quote. Do you know what Edmund Burke went on to say? This is, this is incredible. He goes on to say, when bad men combine, good men must also combine. Good men must associate or else they will fall one by one a pitiful sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. This reminds me of being in 11th grade. My history teacher would always come in, and I loved him because he, he's the one that taught me my great accents. He's the one that would always come in with British accents, <laughs> and French, and all these things. He would come up, and he, would, he had this quote about Benjamin Franklin. And he said, oh, my friends, my people, we shall better, we must hang together or we shall surely hang separately. What was he saying? 
saying, guys, as the days grow darker and men's hearts grow colder, we will need to link arms. We will need to come together as his church. We are the light of the world. This past week, you all saw the news reports commemorating the tragedy of 9-11. Worthy to remember. We have V-Day. We have VJ Day, Victory of Japan Day. We have Holocaust Memorial Day. And I, from time to time, will see the famous quote from Pastor Martin Niemöller that says this. He says, first, they came for this group, but I said nothing because I really wasn't part of that group. And then they came for this group, but I said nothing because I wasn't part of that group. And then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I'm not a Jew. And then he finished with this. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. See, the path of least resistance is the easy path. This is the path that leads to horrors like the Holocaust, because it's easier to say nothing. It's easier to go along, to take the path of least resistance, to bow down to the idols of whatever age you are living in. But God is uncompromising. And when he tells Joshua, throw away your idols, and they're slow to throw away their idols, don't be surprised if God has righteous judgment. Oh, we can't talk about that, Pastor. That's politically incorrect. You can't go there. God's just a God of rainbows and he would love. Oh, God is a God of love, but he is absolutely a God of holiness. So you say, all right, Pastor, I don't get it. I don't have any golden statues. I don't have any idols. I've watched Indiana Jones. I know exactly what it is, right? You got the little golden idol. If you throw me the idol, I throw you the whip and all that stuff. And that was a lie, by the way. He didn't do it. Sorry, spoiler. <laughs> if you haven't seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's been like 40 years, so that's on you. How do you define an idol? Here's a great definition. Whatever consistently takes you away from God, that is your idol. You picturing anything? I'm, you know what? Let me amend this. How about this? It's going to hurt. Whatever consistently distracts you from God, ooh, that is also an easy potential idol. What is it? What shiny trinket distracts you? Look over here. Whatever consistently takes you away from God, there it is. Are you fully committed to serving God in all faithfulness? If so, cast down your idols. It may mean physically doing something. It may mean doing what we did when I was a teenager. When the Lord got a hold of me and then he spread through. Oh, it's awesome. Revival hit my family. I was so proud of my dad. A NASA engineer, a secular, basically atheist Super, super bright egghead, you know, just had it all figured out. And when God got a hold of him and broke him, and he broke through our whole family. I'll never forget one night he said, gather up anything that does not honor the Lord and meet me out back. I've got my hair standing up. We had a barrel. Well, he had read Acts 19, which they had an Acts 19 bonfire. And he brought out all kinds of stuff. And he threw it into that barrel, and then he lit it. And I said, wow, this is change. I went inside my house, and I grabbed stuff. I mean, I don't know what I was, burning, Star Wars toys, whatever was an idol. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of sin built up yet at this young age, but I was like, I'm going to throw, I think I've got a Judas Priest album somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Burn it. Burn it. We threw whatever is in there. And guys, this was not some legalistic expression. You know what this was? This was us saying, God, we're all in. We hold nothing back. I'm going to prove it by <laughs> burning Darth Vader and <laughs> my Judas Priest album. Right? This is us saying, I choose this day whom I will serve. I remember that 40 some years later. Look at verse 15 again. Joshua then gives them a choice. He says, if you refuse to serve the Lord, then I want you to choose today whom you will serve. See the accountability coming in here? Will you prefer the gods your ancestors did? Are you going to be these? Are you going to be the Amorites? I'm telling you guys, it doesn't matter. Because as for me and my family, we're declaring we will serve the Lord. Don't forget who's saying this. This is 110-year-old warrior, Joshua, who knows what the cost of commitment is. Think about what he's seen. He has seen the plagues. Yeah, those plagues. 
We've read about them. He has seen the waters part. We've only read about it. He has walked through hearing the screams from the angel of death. We've only read about it. He has walked through the wilderness. He's seen manna. He's seen quail rain from the sky. Guys, he knows what it means to be the minority voice saying, this is not right. I'm going to stand up and be a faithful voice in the wilderness. He knows what it is to declare righteousness and see everybody else go the other way. <laughs> Even family and friends. So he knows what he's talking about. He's saying, guys, this is not a lighthearted thing I'm about to ask you to do. I love what Francis Schaeffer says. He says, when you serve the Lord wholeheartedly in all faithfulness, there is a Hebrew word in the grammatical tense used here literally implies that Joshua is saying, I am going to choose to serve the Lord, but I am going to not only say I've chosen to serve God, but I'm choosing to continue to serve God. I'm going to stay on this path, and I'm going to go on choosing the same path. Think about this. I'm going to serve God in all faithfulness. You see how knowing the, the original language changes the impact and the power of this? You will fall into a dangerous trap because most of us kind of go on autopilot. We go with the previous decision. I accepted the Lord. I surrendered to Christ. I remember I was baptized right over here. Pastor Matt did it. I remember he had hair back then. It was great. It was a good moment. We, we, and we think it's a one-time thing of surrendering in obedience. But imagine if you treated your marriage like that. I mean, here's, here's a picture of my wedding day. Oh, there's my pretty bride. Back I had hair. I still can't get over it. Now imagine if I get up there and I say, hang on a second, Pastor. I just got a quick thing I need to say to my wife. Baby, I love you. And I want you to write that down. Because you're never going to hear me say it again. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. I love you. Would that be sufficient? Uh, that's a big no. No way. Why? Because loving her is an ongoing act of service. And showing her, I value you. This isn't a one-time deal. I'll check in with you in 30 years. Hey, you know, I still love you, right? Hey, <laughs> can, you can you imagine Amy <laughs> putting up with that from Matt? <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here. And deservedly so. Guys, this is what, this is what he's talking about. When we look ahead at our commitment I mean, I read scriptures that say, today, take up your cross and follow me. Well, what's a cross? It's not a pretty jewelry. It's an instrument of execution. And then I see Paul talking about wholeheartedly, I will die daily. I want to serve the Lord in all faithfulness. This is why so many people continue to fall back to bad habits, because they're, they're relying on a, a commitment from the past. Did you know that? They don't wake up in the morning and say, God, I surrender all. I crucify my flesh today. I want you to put your armor on me from head to toe, and I'm going to walk today in newness of life and claim what you've promised me, and I am going to turn my back on sin again today. It is going to be a daily surrender of my life. This is how you walk in victory. I don't say, well, back in 1988, I got on a bus from Alabama, and I went to Ridgecrest, and I got saved, and woohoo! Hadn't opened my Bible since, hadn't been to church since, hadn't worshiped the Lord. You see what I'm saying? This is an ongoing process where we say, God, I'm going to step up. I'm going to change my mindset. I'm going to allow you to change my heart, my commitment, my will. And look what happens. Look at verse 16 with me. And then the people said, no, we'll never go back. We'll never abandon the Lord. We'll never serve these other gods. The Lord, your God, he's awesome. He's the one that rescued us. We know this. We got the slavery. We traveled through the wilderness. We were, you, you reminded all of us. We agree with you. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the nations living here in the land. So yeah, we too will serve the Lord for he alone is God. And we think, whoo, they got it. All right, way to go. Ricky Bobby's here. Let's just charge it. Leroy Jenkins. And we say, no, there's something strange that happens here. Joshua goes, mm, no, 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 you don't, you don't fear the Lord. Wait, what? No, I don't think you're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to remind you, he is a jealous God. And he is not going to forgive your rebellion and your sin. Can you imagine the shock of the people that he said that in the very next verse? They're like, well, no, no, you just told us to repent, and we did. We're with you. We're standing on this, and we're all together. He's like, uh-uh. No, no, no. No, no, no. You're not there. Let me just ask a, a, a question. I'm just going to let the tension hang in the air. Why 
in the world would God say such a thing? Through Joshua, after the people just committed themselves to serving him in all faithfulness. Why would God do that? Could it be that he doesn't want them to have some emotional caught up in the moment response? Could it be that he wanted them to count the cost? Could it just be that he says, guys, this is a covenant. Do not take this lightly. You have a poor track record. This isn't going to be the same old, same old. Today, we are drawing a line in the sand. If you step over this, there is no going back. I think that's the next admonition that Josh was saying. He said, guys, you got to know, and you have to count the cost. Don't follow Christ half-heartedly. Milo and I were driving to church this morning. We were talking about, you know, it's just amazing how the roads are completely empty on Sunday morning. It's easy to get to church on time. At least it should be. I'm like, people don't realize there's a cost to following Christ. We have made it so easy. This country is so blessed we don't know what persecution is. Our brothers and sisters around the world do. And I think Joshua is saying, guys, you need to count the cost. Remember, Joshua had seen this before. He'd watched this movie. He watched Moses give the same speech, go up on a mountain to meet with God, come down face glowing, all ready to see the people. And he comes down and he finds debauchery happening. A golden calf, they're bowing down, they're, they're having a drunken orgy. He comes down, can you imagine? And Joshua's like, about that. I was going to say something. They're, these people are crazy. <laughs> can you imagine? Joshua's seen this before, and he's saying, guys, I don't think you want to, I'm going to give you a final warning. And then he says this in verse 20. Look what he says. He says, if you abandon the Lord and you serve other gods, he'll turn against you. And he will destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. All right, let's bring this home. I don't think this is just a story about ancient history. I believe God's word can apply and should apply to us. And I want us to look at this, and I think, guys, we also tend to forget. We ignore warnings in scriptures. I think if Joshua were here, he would say to us today, church, capital C, church, if you forsake God and you serve other gods, insert your God of choice, materialism, money, status, fear, fear can be an idol, safety, good night. If these last four years have not taught us anything, that we prize safety over everything, that could become an idol. The gods of this world if we serve other gods, then we cannot expect the blessing of God. Think about this. We can't expect his favor when we're blatantly unfaithful. I know this isn't a popular thing to talk about, but guys, this is what the church needs to hear. Jesus says, come out from them and be separate. There needs to be a difference. When we walk down the halls at schools, other kids should be able to look at you and identify and say, there's something different about them. Something about Jesus, I don't know what it is, but I kind of dig it and I kind of want some. Our neighbors should be able to tell there's something. To, guys, if we fit in with the culture so much that they can't tell us apart, we're marching the same way. And here is a dire warning. If you abandon the Lord and you serve other gods, if we choose to serve other gods, we fail to serve the one true God. Look back at history. Look at the nations who turn their back on God. We don't need any more warning than verse 20. If I were to show this in a modern-day theological term, here's a great song, a hymn of our faith. Anybody remember this one? Five Little Monkeys. Great hymn of our faith. Five little monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and... Oh, you know it, right? And it goes on, they call the doctor, and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. And then, sure enough... Four little monkeys, them. they go through, and then three, and then they fall, they broke his head, and go on to, and you think, oh, this is just an annoying song about subtraction. It's not. It is a deep theological hymn of faith. Do you know, if we look at this song, you know what this song really should teach us? Learn from the mistakes of others. I look at these monkeys, and I think, how goofy are these guys? 
Like, really? You saw the fourth one do it? And then the third one? And, the, and you, none of you connected the dots? None of you could look ahead and crack the code and go, they all keep falling. Couldn't anyone see a trend here? Guys, and I think we do the same thing. We don't learn from our past mistakes, and then we repeat them. I read about a mom who was being harassed by her kids to finally take them ice skating, but there was no ice skating rink in her town. She had to go to the next town. This was years ago, long before GPS and long before MapQuest, my favorite. Remember when you had to print it and carry it around? So after a horrible time trying to find the ice rink, it was a birthday party she was supposed to be to at a certain time, and several wrong turns and stopping and asking various people at gas stations, where is this ice rink? Finally, they arrived just as the party was ending. About halfway through the trip, the mom looked at the kids and said, you know what? Why don't we stop and ask God for directions? Maybe we should do that. So they finally arrived, but it was too late. A week later, she decided to make it up to them by taking the kids ice skating one more time. She loads them up, and the five-year-old son pipes up and says, hey, mom, let's pray now and save time. Can we do that? What, what did he do? He learned from her mom's mistakes. He looked ahead. He saw with wisdom. He said, you know what? We're going to learn from our mistakes. So in verse 21, the people once again respond positively. Look at here. He says, but the people answered Joshua, no, we'll serve the Lord. You've already challenged us. You're a witness to our decision. And Joshua says, this is it. Okay. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes. They replied, as if to further spin it. We are witnesses to what we have said. Guys, this is huge. This is taking an oath. This is solemn. And Joshua says, all right then, destroy the idols. He comes back to it. This was a big deal. If you're serious, destroy the idols from among you. Turn your hearts to the Lord. Give it to the God of Israel. Then the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him and him alone. But you know how people are, how quickly they forget. And I love what Joshua does, as if to cement it. He does something very odd. He goes over and he finds this huge boulder. And he rolls it beside the tabernacle. This is not an accident. And he parks it underneath a terebinth tree. Look what he says. He says, okay, as a reminder of this agreement... He took a huge stone, he rolled it beneath the terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord, so they would see it every time they come to the tabernacle. And then Joshua said to all the people, this stone has heard everything, not the Jews said, everything the Lord said to us, and it will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word. This stone will testify against you. Y'all, stones don't normally talk. Stones don't normally test. I mean, this is, they're like quaking. Think of, put yourself in this moment. Their leader, who's about to die, saying, this rock is going to be the testimony. Again, you've heard what the Lord has said. He's heard what you've said. This is a solemn contract. Why do you think he did that? Because he knew our hearts. He knew our hearts are frail. And he knew how easily we fall back into old ways when we don't seek after the Lord. We know how easily we forget commitments. We still do this today. Every time I do a wedding, I hold up a wedding ring. Why? Because it's a symbol of the commitment they are about to make forever. Every time I preach, every time, I don't pull out another table, I don't get up on a stage, I stand behind this cross. Why? Because it is a reminder to me the commitment God made when he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die for my sin. This is why we preach behind a cross. It is a symbol. These are physical reminders. When we come and we gather and we sing and we actively worship and we bring our tithes and our offerings saying, God, you've given me everything. Here's a portion back as a thank you. I love you. When we come and we take the Lord's Supper, when we come and we're baptized, these are all physical reminders of the commitment we have made to our awesome God. These are reminders to serve God in all faithfulness. So my question for us, and then we'll land the plane here. Is it a commitment we make here, or does it leave those doors? Does it go any farther than the lobby? As we head down the, the final backstretch of 2024, I don't think there is a better passage 
than Joshua 24, to remind us of our commitment to serve God wholeheartedly in all faithfulness. God is a loving God, and the choice is ours. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Let me pray for us. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that it cuts sharper than a two-edged sword, and I thank you that you give us the ability to come home, to return back. I pray, Lord, that you would receive a repentant heart, that you would restore the joy of our salvation, that we would return to the Father who loves us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us individually. Forgive us as a church. Forgive us as a nation. Forgive us as a, as a humanity. God, we know and acknowledge you are the creator. God, I pray when we leave this place today, we would shine bright, that you would use us to stand out, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that we know that the days grow darker, men's hearts grow colder, the time is short. May we be about the Father's business. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, before we leave, I've got a couple exciting things i got to share. I've been so excited about this, all right? So as we finish this morning, remember your challenge. That's your challenge. We're going to give God 100%. Hold nothing back. Whatever you do, always give 100% unless you are donating blood, in which case do not do that. Some of you, you'll get that later. We have some uh, really cool, exciting stuff, but I don't want to give it away. If you've been paying attention, we are hosting a big event this Saturday night. Somebody shout out what it is. Hmm. The Married Up Date Night. That's right. Okay. This is going to be so cool. We don't get to do a whole lot of these. We did a lot of stuff, and COVID kind of changed the world, but we are back and trying to be a, a light in this community. This is open to everybody. So this week, we got to go up to his radio studios. Milo and I were there, and we got to record our first big commercial in 10 years for the Potter's Hand. And if you haven't heard it, we're going to play it for you in a minute because it's so cool to hear the name of the church shouted out over the airwaves. So if you got it, we'll talk about it. You can play it. And then we'll uh, talk just a little bit. Hey, I'm Pastor Matt at the Potter's Hand Church in Apex asking you this. When's the last time you and your spouse had a fun date night? Been too long? Well, you're invited to a fun night out without the kids, but with laughter and encouragement for you both. It's the Married Up Date Night at Potter's Hand Church in Apex. You've seen Dan and Danielle McCauley on TV. Now join them in person for a date night that you need. Saturday, September 21st at 7 p.m. A couple's pass is just $20 at phbiblechurch.org. See you there. Yeah, so that's cool. We're excited about that. Uh, His Radio is partnered with us. We have a map here. I want you to listen to His Radio this week. These are the heat maps of where you live. If you listen, if you live near Cary, Holly Springs, and Gardner, 107.7 is the station that's playing its strongest. If you live up in the north, there's a big 100,000 watt station that's 88.5. That's a little bit further up north. Uh, some of you may be down towards Sanford and uh, Fayetteville, then you want to listen to 90.1. All right, so does everybody kind of see their city? Everybody got your numbers? Take a picture if you need to. Which one? Oh, yeah, if you want to get fancy and use technology, yes, you can listen online. <laughs> totally forgot about that. So see Sarah if you know how to do that. I don't know. I've heard about this intraweb thing. It's supposed to be fantastic. I personally think it's a fad. It's going to die. So, All right, that is your mission. If you hear it, let us know. Maybe post about it, share that this is something for everybody. It is going to be awesome. Really want to support these guys. They're coming in. Not only are they going to be here Saturday night, they're going to stick around and join us Sunday morning. So they're going to be with us in worship, going to talk about relationships. It's going to be a fantastic night. All right, some other cool stuff coming. Uh, Where's Fernando? Is Fernando up here? On the front row. Come stand up here. Don't be shy. This guy got on a plane and flew in from Connecticut like 20 minutes ago to make sure he is here. You all have known Fernando and Colin with the youth ministry for a long time. He's been great all summer long, but we have the privilege. We are going to be bringing him on board. We're expanding our team, and he is going to officially join us as our youth pastor. He is going to be starting this week as in now. Yeah, you can clap for that. We're so excited. Now, Colin, where are you at, Colin? Right here on the road. Okay, Colin's not going anywhere. We're expanding Colin's role as well. Colin is going to be becoming our connections pastor, and he is going to be having even more. They're not going anywhere. You're going to see a lot more of both of them. So after church, if you come up and just give them a big hug and congratulate to let you know, 
We are growing, and we are adding to our team to faithfully try to minister to the people in this area to keep up with the growth, and I am so excited about what God is doing as he grows us. We're, gonna, we're just going to see great things happen, and uh, one of the great things that I brought Fernando up to share is United Student Night. All right, uh, we got a microphone that works for you. Let's see. You can talk loud, but I've got... Jason, is this one okay? I'll use the flathead. That's good. This way people online, see, oh, Sarah, I got it. People online can hear this. There's your lightsaber. All right, you want to talk about this? And then afterwards, I'm going to let you pray. Okay. It's all you. All right. See you later. Well, here we go. Um, all righty, so United, um, United is, this is just a night, um, but United is more than just a night. Um, March 14th and 15th is going to be the main United. Um, it's basically a bunch of youth um, groups coming together and worshiping God under one roof. Um, you get to serve. Um, they, there was one year we, we made a bunch of cards um, for like a nursing home. Um, we cleaned up a local high school. We did stuff like that. We did it together as a youth, not only as my youth together, but we joined other youth, as, youth groups as well. But this is just like kind of just a sneak peek of what United truly is. So this is just going to be a worship night. Um, it's going to be 6 to 8. It's going to be September 28th at Providence Church in Raleigh. Um, if you know someone that wants to go to this, please, please, please share it with them. Um, it, it's $5. That is it. Um, and it's just to cover their fees of, of renting the place. But it's going to be a really amazing time. It's going to be really great. Um, so that, that is that. Wonderful. Yes. Well, let's, let's stand. Um, get you out of here. We'll pray. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for letting us have this day, Lord. Um, thank you for allowing us to, to be here and to worship you, Lord. Um, help us to go back into this world, Lord, um, and, and take what Pastor Matt said today, for us to be all in, for us to be surrendered to you, not just the 99%, but, but the 100, Lord. Um, we, we can't na navigate life without you, Lord. Um, that 99%, yes, it might, it might sound like a lot, Lord, but we need that 100, Lord. Help us to be all in. Help us to, to serve you and worship you um, in everything we say and everything we do. We ask all this in your name. Amen.